Jason, I want to go back to Russia for a minute. Uh, Putin today said going into Ukraine was the right decision. Is that a message that is backed up with anything? No, in fact, I think he's saying that as a way to save face in front of his generals and the array that was that theater, that uh, parade today. But in reality, he overestimated his forces. Uh, of course, they were lying up through the ranks to, to surmise that they would be able to do this invasion within three days. Everything they've done so far has shown that the Russian military was not up to this. Their logistics, their conscripts, the training, the senior leadership, the lack of an NCO for everything that's put them in the position they're in now. So for him to say that, that's just pure propaganda. Yeah, I mean, Rick, Putin also placed more blame on the West during his Victory Day speech. How do you think the U.S. and leaders in, in Europe will, will listen to Putin's message? Is there going to be any reaction to that? I don't think so, Jose. I mean, as Clint said earlier, it was slightly more muted than people expected. He didn't declare victory, which, of course, is a hard thing to do when you're losing. Um, there wasn't the kind of um, martial militaristic talk that we sometimes hear from him. Uh, you know, Putin has been blaming the West for 20 years. There's nothing that would be surprising to European leaders. What I think other European leaders have pointed out, in Putin talking about Ukraine, not denazification, they make the point that Putin is actually the one mirroring the Nazis' behavior by invading a uh, defenseless uh, country that didn't provoke them. That's what the Nazis did in the beginning of World War II. And by the way, they were joined by Russia then in 1939 when they jointly invaded Poland. Good, good. And, and Rick, I, I love it. You're such a keen student of history. And I'm, I'm just kind of want to your, your thoughts on, on these images, right? I mean, the images of, of Putin there uh, shaking hands with generals that have more, uh, you know, uh, medals on their chest than, than, than uh, I guess, uh, heavyweight uh, lifters do. Uh, but it, 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 I, Putin needs to have some internal support to continue going forward. Putin needs to have some military leaders to support him or else, you know, he'll wake up Ceausescu one day. But how does this <laughs> work, right? Well, 100 percent, Jose. He needs internal support. And by the way, his audience for this May 9th uh, spectacle, which is a combination for them of like July 4th and Thanksgiving rolled into one, is a domestic audience primarily. He's not thinking about us. He wants to shore up his support in Russia. And by the way, the support in Russia for the Russian victory over Nazism, where they lost 27 million people, it's an incalculable mm -hmm. uh, a, a number. So he's trying to hitch his current war effort with patriotism around the, the great patriotic war, as the Russians call it. It's not something that would persuade people in the West, but it may persuade people within Russia. And Jason, Ukraine's President Zelensky told G7 leaders Sunday in a video message that Ukraine will need between five to seven billion dollars a month in support as long as this war continues. Have we even scratched the surface of how much more the need will be if this continues dragging on? I mean, I, we do not have an endless supply of money. I will say that the White House and Americans are very generous. We've supported this effort. There's been a ton of lethal munitions that have uh, gone into this fight. After the war, uh, this is not over. They do have to rebuild. Uh, but let's, let's focus for a moment on what America needs. Um, we have near-peer rivals in China uh, facing across the Straits of Taiwan. And the very lesson that the White House ought to be taking from this is during that pre-phase intelligence, when we knew Russia was going to invade Ukraine, that was the right time to put weapons in the hands of Zelensky's forces, not six weeks into the campaign. So let's get in front of the next one in Taiwan. Our Navy is struggling to compete on the seas in the South Pacific China. We watch the Navy pretty closely. We ought to be putting 10 and 16 billion uh, dollars towards an investment in our own security so that we don't have to get behind these uh, sort of events, these evasions. We can get a little bit in front of them because these weapons do make a difference. The real lesson here is get in front, not behind these invasions. Yeah, and Rick, meanwhile, senior Biden officials said Sunday the U.S., EU, and G7 nations will impose more sanctions on Russia. What would those look like, and, and how many more can you continue doing? Well, you know, to pick up where Jason left off, I mean, maybe the lesson of 
of sanctions is to get in early and go bigger instead of uh, do a kind of a drip, drip, drip approach. We've done a lot already. You know, as I've said to you before, Jose, the, the biggest sanction, of course, is the EU cutting itself off from Russian oil and gas. That's bigger than all the sanctions that we can apply. But in fact, uh, we're tightening the screws. There were a new round of sanctions against Belarusians. Uh, so sanctioning uh, Putin's allies is a way of undermining what he's trying to do. So we're just tightening the screws. And again, sanctions have a long-term effect, not an immediate one. Yeah, Jason, just uh, the, taking off what Rick says, I mean, the G7 leaders said Sunday they plan to phase out or ban imports of Russian oil, not talking about natural gas, which, by the way, they get most of from Russia. They said it will, quote, hit hard at the main artery of Putin's economy. Should this step have already been happened uh, already? Yeah, certainly. I mean, we're, we're behind, again, in the case of uh, natural gas and oil and, and things like this. Europe is so reliant on Russia for this, they were always going to be in a bad position, which, again, was the critical reason why these weapons, artillery pieces, javelins, stingers, those should have been in the hands of the Ukrainians to convince Putin that he would not have an easy time of this. Now that he's stuck in it, we're having to fuel behind. These sanctions will have an effect, but as uh, Richard Stengel uh, just said, they are long-term. What has to happen on the ground right now is Zelensky is going to need to convert the weapons the U.S. has pushed into their hands into an immediate, decisive battlefield defeat so that the ground forces, the armor and the artillery um, that the Russians are using are broken. They don't have the infantry to back them up. That's why you're seeing the air campaigns, the bombardment, and the artillery pieces firing on these cities, because they are short on infantry. That's the advantage that Zelensky needs to work within, break that battlefield seam open, use the howitzers that the U.S. gave him, and start knocking out those pieces up and down that eastern front. Jason Beersley, Clint Walks, and Rick Stengel, thank you so much for being with us this morning. I very much appreciate it.